Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Techno Crime Fighters Forum, episode number 34. I'm Ramola D, and I'm here this morning with Dr. Catherine Horton and with um, Karen Melton Stewart. And we're here this morning once again to discuss ongoing issues of criminality. Oh, excuse me, one moment while I fix that. Actually, that reminds me, um, we're both following the chat. Um, we're trying to respond to the chat as well, a bit more frequently. And um, every time we do, we sometimes forget to switch off the audio. So we hear ourselves back with a delay. That reminds me, um, we're both following the chat. Um, we're trying to My respond name is to Nancy. the chat as well, a bit more frequently. And um, every time we do, we sometimes forget to switch off the audio. So we hear ourselves. That's exactly what's going on over here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Um, I finally found the right browser page and switched it off. Um, but uh, welcome again. And um, we have a lot of uh, disturbing issues to speak about this morning. And um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Catherine to open the subject for us. Yes, yeah, so um, I guess what we should start with is um, I, I want people to know all the attacks that the criminal investigation team is suffering because um, we can certainly feel that, um, well, we, we certainly know for a fact that this is actually a silent war, but it's um, turning more and more into a, into a hot shooting war. People are dying, people are being murdered, and the victims are being um, killed off, and we are being shot at with the aim of um, killing us. And I think all of us have felt over the last couple of weeks that the attacks have um, become extreme. Um, on top of the physical attacks on us with directed energy weapons, they have also been um, takedown operations. We have um, witnessed quite a few. We already reported on um, the takedown operation against Frederic Laroche in France um, and how, for example, the, um, uh, the, the um, pre uh, préfet de l'Isère um, was involved according to his view and the police were involved and they um, created this ludicrous spectacle. But the same um, strategy um, is also being applied to us. So our team has um, had several hits, um, very, very um, rough hits. So for example, um, you probably also noticed that um, Dr. Paul Marco and Mindy weren't attending the last um, few weeks and that's because they have um, a couple of family matters um, to see to and um, I, we believe they also have been physically hit but they have you know some medical issues to attend to as well and when you um, it's it's only when you actually chart the density with which extreme and otherwise very rare events um, seem to hit us um, with a ludicrously high frequency that's when you realize that actually there's something else going on so um, what we're experiencing is is um, all-out warfare from this organized crime cartel that's acting through the intelligence agencies. Uh, but I think what's very, very important for the listeners to know so that they first of all, understand in, at, at what stage we're in this, uh, in this war we're actually at. So we're way past just a discussion phase. We're way past just the hypothesizing and theorizing if this is, uh, these crimes actually even exist or if this, these criminal actions even exist. We're now really in the midst of an extremely hot war and um, we have to face up to the fact that um, the goal is to take people out. So um, we I want people to understand that we need their support now, not next week or next month, but actually now more than ever. Um, and to highlight that, I would like, I've promised um, uh, uh, Dr. Melissa Black to read out um, her statements about her current situation. Unfortunately, she can't be here because she has to um, attend a medical appointment. And the medical appointments, again, are necessary because of the um, sustained attacks she receives from this criminal um, retired um, Air Force veteran Randall Webster who is now running amok with kit that belongs to the Air Force and um, seems to be incorporated into this uh, global weapon system but um, Randall Webster is having his own private shootout war um, in Tennessee where he's terrorizing an entire community and Dr. Melissa Black is his is and has been his personal um, torture slave for almost almost three decades by now but he is systematically mutilating her and we have already shown images about how he used what I think he used um, pulsed microwave energy to um, to well to to literally um, um, chafe away bone um, in her knee to cripple her knees and um, you know and it's just I'm going on and on and on but to to actually um, 
explain to you what we're dealing with, I would like to read out um, Millicent's own words um, that she just sent um, <clears throat> just yesterday, basically. She says, the torture is horrible. He violates me any way that his demented mind takes him. So, so far lately, he wakes me up at 4 a.m. saying that's all, um, all the sleep I get. Then he starts to heat my body and gouge up inside my um, th uh, thoracic um, cavity in a way that uh, would make you scream. He gloats that I can't get away from him. That's what he said in 2008. Now that's almost 10 years ago. Um, that he couldn't wait until I found out that I couldn't get away from him. He threatens to kill me if I have um, if I have the surgery, to kill me if I do this or that. Makes me sick to need medical attention. Then tells me you can't pay them. This is the most preposterous program in the world. And then she says, my constant disclaimer, I understand that Randall L. Webster is not acting alone in the torture of this living soul. I further realized that I could hear his voice real time via computer voice morphing or via Medusa type broadcasting of silent audio. I'm not delusional about the wounds and traumatic injuries I report or about the fact that I recognize the voice of Randall um, Webster as brain to brain communication and or brain computer interface, both via satellite or satellite based communication systems. So I I want to really um, go through this because for people who don't know about the technology, they maybe don't understand what she's on about. But um, Me um, Millicent has, um, I think, was it 56 body implants, non-consensual body implants in her body? Um, uh, a profession. Hmm? 53. 53. 53 and a professional in the field who um, is an expert on scanning for these uh, non-consensual body implants um, has told her that um, this is I think one of the um, the you know the most implanted cases um, that has been measured by that investigator so um, what these body implants are used for is for to cause physical torture, inflammation of tissue, um, joint pain, um, but also with time through the inflammation and also in combination with directed energy weapons to erode away bone to cripple her. And this um, psychopath, who we also think is a serial killer because he has gloated about um, a lot of deaths that then occurred or were extremely suspicious in the past, um, what we think is this a psychopathic serial killer. Um, he's also connected up to her chips um, through um, communication devices. Um, and now, my personal view is that these chips are emitting high enough that you can probably read them out at something like 100 meters, perhaps, um, at most, so that I think they are transmitters placed around the victims at all times. But once um, these little chips are read out by an amplification unit, um, they can be broadcast to just like mobile phone towers to satellites and so on. So the victims experience that once they have these body chips, they can be tracked pretty much wherever they are in the world. Now, what Millicent is saying is that she has been um, linked up to this uh, perpetrator um, for several years, so several decades actually, ever since she had these body implants. And he has full control over the chips, um, which means that he can inflict pain. Um, he can also cripple her with pain. Um, he can cause muscle cramps, I think, a lot of symptoms because these chips are so varied in their functionality. But also she has um, implants in her ears, um, the... the um, signal the analog signal going to the chips has already been measured it has even been picked up and measured by people who didn't even expect to find that signal and it was considered um highly unusual um and through these chips in her ears she's receiving um voice commands by the way by the way so this is called uh, voice to skull and there are many many different ways to deliver voice to skull there's something called the fry effect which is i think um microwave hearing when you put a a microwave beam straight into the skull and um, you know the um, auditory system can pick it up including the brain but there's another uh, way to do that which is through these implants these cochlear implants and I would like to bring up now that we're on the topic an article that I think appeared hang on I think it's in the the Sunday mirror exactly I have to look up the um, exact date but it wasn't that long ago so um, this is an, a report about medical implants and I want to bring it up because I suspect that a lot of people who are experiencing voice to skull like our colleague dr. black might have had this technology put in them illegally 
by the intelligence agencies or other criminal gangs. So um, the uh, ad I would like, to, or the, the article I would um, read out um, is this one. So th this appeared in the UK in the Sunday Mirror, and it says, your um, OP, I was born with major hearing loss due to um, maternal rubella. Then in 2014, I lost all my natural hearing. It had a profound impact and I became very isolated. I had a cochlear implant at the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital in London in December 2014. The surgeon drilled a hole behind my right ear and inserted a magnet to send sound impulses. Electrodes were inserted into my cochlea to take on the role of my damaged cochlear hairs. I could not hear for a few weeks, but life changed once the implant was activated a month later. My hearing is in normal ranges and I'm confident and happy again. Now, this is a woman um, who had it done voluntarily, but my point is that such a cochlear implant that, and, and notice that this is bypassing the cochlear hairs, can be put into your head even when you're healthy. And that will become a second, a second way to hear sound. Now, if this is done to you by the intelligence agencies and criminal gangs, they will break into your home at night, they will just put it in, and then they de will deliver the sound that they want to deliver. It could be um, a tone, like tinnitus. Um, they can also deliver pain through these implants, but also they can deliver voices, okay? And once they can do that, they can literally just um, talk at you 24-7. And this is what a lot of the victims of the intelligence agencies and the military technology are reporting and our colleague dr melissa black is reporting that she keeps getting voice transmissions non-stop from this one guy um, randall webster now her disclaimer um, is important because she keeps saying that um, she is aware that it could be more than one perpetrator and also they are either software there's software that can do what's called voice morphing so it can mimic the voice print of any other person um, this means that you can talk into a microphone and it can come out sounding like Barack Obama or any other celebrity that you want to if you have really good software. That is possible by now. Um, so you can't be 100% sure. However, in her case, um, this guy has stalked her. She even had to have a, um, a court case to have a temporary restraint order against this guy. So he, in, in her particular case, we're fairly confident that he is directly involved and continues to be directly involved. So, so much about the disclaimer. Now, I am emphasizing this case because it, um, it unifies so many of the different aspects that vi victims are reporting, okay? So if you understand this one case, um, then you can make, um, you can draw conclusions about your own case should you be affected by, by voice to skull. So um, namely, what I mean exactly is that if you hear a voice, and uh, it's actually people report that sometimes they hear uh, voice to skull harassment by people like Barack Obama. Now, um, if you're reporting that, um, people have a tendency to just, um, you know, put you away as delusional because they think, how could Barack Obama spend 24-7 just talking to you, right? And um, all the psychiatrists think that as soon as they come up with what they think is a brilliant argument, it's done and dusted and you're delusional. Well, this is not so. If you're hooked up to, um, you know, this military technology, then the people who hooked you up and had the resources to come into your home and implant, you also have the resources to use voice morphing technology, um, you know, or just software that generates output that sounds like Barack Obama. So this is not anything unusual. This is something that the intelligence agencies do all the time. I mean, most people know, for example, that high profile people will have doubles or doubles, um, however you pronounce it. Um, and that's just you know, path to course. It's just normal. This is just what's done. So mimicking their voice, as much as you would have a machine that, um, you know, does the autograph for you when you have to sign a lot of papers, the voice morphing is also part and parcel of that. So this is nothing unusual. So I'm just saying, if you're a victim of voice to skull and you have, you know, say a celebrity who talks to you, it might not be the celebrity. It might be mimicking it. And if you put in a disclaimer like that, you know, your, your story becomes, first of all, a lot more credible, but also you give people 
um, some assistance in trying to figure out what's going on in with your case. And and Catherine, we should probably also say, sorry to interject, but I just thought it might be useful also to point out that although it is well known in certain circles, it is also not well known in certain circles. And those yeah. circles are the medical circles and the psychologist circles and the psychiatrist circles. They do not know or they do not seem to know that COVID implantation is in fact historic artifact of the intelligence agency's methodology and it's something that they continue to do yes i think this is something that they um they they yeah i i think by now it's an industry it's an industry and um oh god i should i should bring it up because there's um there are statements to this effect already from um high profile um intelligence heads um hang on a second um so for example let's see if i can find it in one second uh, um so for example I, I will dig out the exact quote but there's a, a journalist called uh, david rose and i think it was in the guardian where he interviewed um sir john scarlett head of mi6 and um in that um in that interview um they talk about the british spying industry Okay, and um, I think uh, uh, Sir John Scarlett has asked, will um, you know, um, intelligence remain a core British industry? And um, you know, um, Scarlett replies, yes. Now, I have to say that as soon as you have a spying industry, what you have is um, proliferating organized crime by definition. So if you have an outfit that's at least on the, you know, on the tin says it's fighting terrorism, yet, admits to and, and thinks it's fair enough that you have something like a British spying industry. I mean, that's a total oxymoron. So that's a dead giveaway that actually what this guy is acquiescing um, to is that, yeah, you've got proliferating organized crime using spying methods, but, you know, that aside. So what the point is, what we actually have these days is this proliferating industry, as in proliferating organized crime, using implanting, using, you know, um, voice to skull torture. and um, what people have to understand are the business plans behind it. Because to a normal person who isn't an organized criminal and who isn't totally psychopathic, it makes no sense why people would gang up on individuals um, from all parts of society and spend literally 24-7 um, just talking at them or send um, voice-generated um, messages to them. But you can use that to traumatize people, um, criminals, and say, just get off on that. You can do brain research based on that and many, many, many other things. So what we're seeing is actually the proliferation of these industries, these business plans. Absolutely. But um, just to finish off on Millicent, I, I really, one of the things I would like people to understand is that we've been talking about Millicent's case ever since we founded the um, Joint Investigation Team and ever since we started with the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. And for the last months um, that this has been going on, it's almost a year, nothing has moved. We have contacted the, um, you know, the police department in um, in her city. We have com we have contacted so many people. We've even contacted the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and people refuse to do anything about it. And I would now submit that, well, the same is also true of all the other cases. We can go through all the things that happened to each one of us. Um, and what people have to understand is um, by now this organized crime cartel has, has captured literally um, vast amounts of the, of the political class, of the law enforcement, of, of the intelligence agencies, of absolutely every single person who you might um, approach for help. And that's what we're dealing with. So what we're now left with is um, at last, the last port of call is civilized court cases before we launch into all out um, physical violence. That's what it is because um, this organized crime cartel is not just um, torturing and mutilating Millicent. It is training up, using her, it's training up hundreds and hundreds of, of thugs who are then given this equipment to victimize even more people and attack even more communities. Um, and this is a, an industry that is spawning these criminals um, like a cancer. And it's a global program. So I want people to understand that every single one of um, our cases is uh well a placeholder for not just thousands of others but for an increasing number of cases so guys you either support us now or we are all stuffed
right? That's basically what I'm trying to say. Look at where we are now. And what Millicent's case, you know, dramatizes and illustrates for all of us as well is the fact that there are all sorts of activities that are sort of flying under the color of law that have been permitted under vast um, labels such as electronic surveillance, but are providing cover for covert weapons testing programs in the realm of electronic weapons and in the realm of neural weapons. This is non-consensual experimentation that is ongoing. And part of what we are doing, part of our, the aegis of what we are covering here is precisely that. We are looking at non-consensual human experimentation that's being reported by victims worldwide. And we are looking to see if we can find scientific evidence for the claims being made. Yes. And as many people know, you know, who are watching us, um, there is indeed scientific evidence that can be found. Right. And that's what Catherine has been talking about in terms of actually scanning for implants, scanning for frequencies being emitted from different parts of the body and um, looking at other denotations of um, assault with directed energy weapons or neural weapons. Well, meter readings that you show the police and they say, we don't know what that means. And then you say, then you find out what it means. You don't just say, sorry. You know, so that's, that's an attitude that needs to change as well. But, I mean, look at the situation we're in, especially in the United States, um, where the educational system has basically gone in the toilet. They're teaching foolish, ridiculous things in the place of solid uh, knowledge. And then you've got a whole, you have a whole group of people, a whole population that, ha that is very low-skilled frankly, very low skilled. I mean, I'm not very good at math and I'm, 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 you know, science, math, et cetera, et cetera. So that's already a predilection that I was born with. So I have to go with art and, and writing and things like that. But we are dumbing down the Americans and I would assume the West, uh, the entire West in regard to science because we're just not teaching it or we're just not teaching math well. And then you've got all these low skill people and they are absolutely desperate to make a living. And, you know, what we're looking at is essentially the people with the skills of a monkey that can hold a directed energy weapon at you or place it. And that's all they can do. They have no other skills and they have no other cares about just mm, mm, me, me, you know, like cavemen. And so they have no higher moral concepts that they're following or able to follow or able to understand. So it's almost like, um, I don't know, a, a devolved human against um, actual humans, but they were given these weapons by people who have exceptional uh, scientific knowledge, but no morals, you know. No and morals. also look, look at the political situation, the economic situation, you know, crash the, crash the economy, build up the surveillance industry, build up the defense industry. That's what's going on in America, right? I mean, the economy yeah. has been crashed. So people are out of, out of jobs. Yes. And so people are taking these jobs because it's money. Mm -hmm. And they're taking money literally to hunt down other humans with directed energy weapons. While at the same time, the corporate media, which is well controlled by these government agencies, um, are maintaining lies, distortions, and defamatory slander about those who are coming forward to report this kind of crime on their persons and on their bodies. Well, well, one thing I found very interesting was the Houston Chronicle carried a story about an Air Force general who said, well, we are developing these directed energy weapons, but we're going to have to start testing them on Americans just to make sure that they work. And I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, how many decades does he know they have been tested on Americans without our consent? So it sounds like what he's doing is trying to set up very light, minor tests of people who volunteer, who actually volunteer, and then you hit them for two or three minutes with something very light, and maybe it prickles the skin, maybe they get a little dizzy, and they go, oh, whoa, you know, yes, that'll break up a crowd, but it doesn't hurt us. So, hey, what's the problem? Why are these other people screaming about, you know, uh, bleeding in the brain and brain lesions? You know, so it seems to me like they're setting up a false narrative to say, no, they never tested it on people. And look, we're testing now and there's no problem. You know, just so it seems to me like there's a shift. There's there's a, there's a coming shift to deny that they have them and are using them to saying, oh, these are not that bad. 
Yeah, oh, exactly. And that's where they're starting from, you know, calling them non-lethal to start with and calling them electronic weapons when yeah. they're actually deadly microwave and millimeter wave and electromagnetic. They're burning weapons, you know, they're weapons that burn the skin, that burn the organs. Yeah, I think well, I, 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 I was trying to come up with, uh, you know, the actual truthful um, uh, name for um, a non-lethal weapon. And I would call it a, um, um, you know, a cancer inducing neurodegenerative weapon. I think no. so. I think. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, that's very good. Microwave mutilation weapons, you know, because that's what it is. Well, I mean, we were trying to get Paul mm -hmm. David Galbots on here and we were having technical difficulties, but he was a military security specialist and he worked at uh, at least one base where they <laughs> where they tested out directed energy weapons, unfortunately on dogs and other animals and killed them, fried them did horrible things to them and they would bring in these animals to the base after dark because they knew people would throw a fit if, if they knew what they were actually doing. But he has said from the start that non-lethal weapons were never designed to be non-lethal. It's a misnomer. They were always designed to be lethal. And the only reason they're non-lethal is that it, you turn them down to, um, I don't know, level one when they were designed to be used at level 10. But if you use even level one, 24 seven, then you're giving the person cancer and you're killing them. So he, he, uh, he had heard a general that, that went on uh, 60 minutes many years ago and was giving the false narrative about non-lethal weapons. And he called up 60 minutes and said, you've been lied to. So that, that was one of the reasons I, I really would love to get him on, but, uh, that's, that's the story. They've never been, you know, they're basically putting them in little frilly dresses and bows and, and giving them to police and saying, oh, these, these are just little non-lethal weapons that we think you'll find useful. Oh, by the way, don't turn them up above five. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I, I, oh, gosh, you know what? Um, the other thing is, I, uh, I, I've got so much to say. I don't know where to start. You know how you said that, um, for example, the educational system has been taken down um, because in, every time we talk about this, my mind already starts racing. Okay, what to do, what to do, what are we going to do about this now, how to proceed? And I think um, we as adults have also been dumbed down because um, in the olden days, there was no t TV. So you... you um, you would talk to, I remember how it was in Transylvania. People would just, you know, come to some, someone's house in the evening, would sit around the table and just talk and talk and philosophize. And, you know, um, and this is how you spent your time and you knew what was going on in your community. You would be training your opinions and these conversations nonstop. You would nonstop intact, but you would also, you wouldn't have any topics that would be, you know, films or, you know, Hollywood movies. You would be talking about what was going on in your town. And um, any sort of topic was um, of interest. Now, that has been, I think, on purpose cut away. As Dr. Paul Marco said, you know, it's called a program, a TV program, because they're trying to program you, okay? That's why. Um, and they wanted to fill your time. So um, all of us have this archive of, of Hollywood movies that we now share as culture, but we don't know what the hell is actually going on, on, on you know, in real life about the, the, the institutions that actually matter. And one of the things that we have gotten um, out of touch with is um, taking res res personal responsibility for all public institutions. So um, it's not good enough to just say, okay, let let's um, leave law enforcement and police work to the police. No, you can't do that. You can't do that because those Muppets need supervision. You know, they, they really are Muppets and by now. So I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but this is like a fact. I'm talking like a, you know, scientists looked into it and found them to be Muppets. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, the other thing is also that, um, for example, the court system, most people don't know what's going on in the court system. I think I'm, I'm one of the very, very few people because I, I was looking into the um, systems analysis of complex human systems. I spent about a year watching the live stream of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. But that's just the Supreme Court I have a view into. You know, I don't know what's going on in the high court. But actually, I think this is now um, our coming of age as a society that we have to remember, hang on, we all need to know about law. We all need to know about medicine and, you know, biology and physics and so on. And that's why in the olden days you received a general education. But there are bits missing and bits have been taken out. We don't know what our rights are. We don't know how the court system works. 
frameworks and in every field where you just leave people to themselves to just run you know a mock on their little you know what um lord sumption called their cabbage patch in that um speech i've um, read out last time well what you get is these people will be um you know you will get these cultural effects they will be amongst themselves and they'll just you know organically grow their systems and it would somehow evolve into this monster every single time. So if you leave police officers to their own devices, they'll just arm themselves more and more and more and more, you know, and go ever more nuts. Um, if the same thing with the lawyers, if you leave their law the lawyers to themselves or the lawmakers, you end up with utter nonsense. There's a speech by uh, Lord Toulson, the Supreme Court judge, who um, um, made a speech about uh, how law by now in the United Kingdom is in, in a lot of cases unintelligible. You know, there are a bunch of statutes and 3,000 new laws or 3,000 new criminal offenses every year. I can't remember. It was like staggering numbers. I have to um, listen to the speech again. And um, what people don't understand is that this is a natural process in every system, this organic growth into total absurdity. So you have to continuously have supervision externally and you have to have interference from outside to stop the system from going off the road, you know, off the track. Now, my point in all this is um, that we all need to learn about the law and we all have a responsibility to follow up what exactly happens in the courts and follow up court cases. You know, we've all been um, pigeonholed away and we come home from work and then, you know, slump down in front of the television and spend, um, you know, the evening watching television. And um, we are not taking care of these things. And what has happened is that these, these monstrosities have grown up where our police is by now totally in deep capture and run by organized crime as you expect it you know to be the end result um the same with the courts we have corrupt judges um just talking nonsense just trying to cream off as much money as possible and please organize crime because also they can't go up against organized crime anymore because the police is not helping them so you know we ended up in this end state whereby none of our institutions are functional and, and they are dragging each other down. You know, you only need one, we'll get to cor corrupt uh, doctors in a moment when we talk about Melanie's case, but <clears throat> if you have, for example, a, a medical malpractice case, what would you do? You would go to maybe report this person to the police. If the police is in on it, you can't do anything. Then you would go to the courts. If the judge is corrupt, you're screwed. There are no more institutions left. You know, you can lobby politicians, but yeah, good luck with that, you know. So our society will stop working. And that's exactly the state we have now. Our society has stopped working and we're now in a situation where, you know, um, Air Force veterans like Randall Webster can just take it from the Air Force, um, hook it up to their satellite systems and their integrated, you know, um, signals intelligence system and spend three decades mutilating women and killing off an entire community one by one. So that's where we're at. So what are we going to do, ladies? Now let's talk about, you know, let's talk about solutions. <laughs> what are we going to do? My audio is being extremely messed with currently, so I'm just going to like leave you guys to speak for a minute while I see if I can do anything at this end. Okay. Um, well, I just finished up a letter to the Attorney General of Florida, and I posted it online. I said, if this can help anybody, then, you know, obviously edit it to fit your Attorney General, your, your state, you know. So, uh, I mean, a lot of people, like I said, just don't, they sit down and they can't gather their thoughts because they're being bombarded, or they're just not writers. Maybe they're fantastic with math, um, which I'm not, so I don't, I don't blame them. So I try to put out some letters and flyers and things like that for people who really don't write and um, they need some kind of help. And it also gives us a common ground. You know, if you are an attorney general and you get several letters that are pretty much similar, then you might start to think, I think there's something here and maybe I need to investigate. So I keep trying to put out letters and things like that and figure out who to, who to contact. Um, like this morning, I took the letter to the attorney general. I just basically sent it to, I don't know, about uh, a dozen uh, newspapers in Florida. And we'll see if they get back to me and do anything with it. And then I also sent it out to a little group of 
targeted individuals in Florida. I said, change it as you want, but if we all send it in, maybe within a week, maybe that'll get their attention too. So uh, I'm hoping that if we get the attention of one attorney general, that uh, especially if it's maybe the Florida one, maybe she'll start to alert other attorney generals, you know, and then and maybe people will start to look into it and take it seriously. Yes, I think there's a great value to actually alerting people and sending letters out. Um, someone from California told me recently that they had contacted their local fusion center and um, asked for the privacy officer at the fusion center and sent this person a letter to detail what was going on in their experience. Now, you know, this is sort of um, going into the lion's den kind of story because the fusion centers are doing this to people. You know, the fusion centers along with the groups of intelligence agencies and military groups are working through the fusion centers to target people and to permit this uh, structured systematic weapons testing operation as well to go on as well as other kinds of non-consensual experimentation. However, when um, I think what you are talking about, Karen, is laying the paper trail, putting it down on paper and creating that trail and keeping that trail continuous. You know, and this is the other thing. I think people take action, um, nobody responds, and then you kind of give up falls into this vacuum again, and you have this system working at uh, beating victims down from all sides. Corporate media won't report it. Law enforcement won't give a damn, you know, won't stand up and fight for people in their own communities. And uh, it, it sometimes seems as if entire cities are turning on people in this fashion. So because there are people who are not responding, it actually becomes more and more important to continually inform people and not just people uh, you know the general public which i think we are doing and you know any kind of journalistic efforts such as the kind that i engage in uh, attempts to do is just to raise awareness and inform the general public about what's going on um, but also as you point out karen those people who are still elected officials who are still supposedly in charge you know who still um, maintain the face they, uh, it's, they, they're the ones with the highest visibility. They're the ones who are supposed to be interested in complaints from the local citizenry. So you create that paper trail and you keep creating it and you actually do not stop. Yes, I think this is a very, very good point. Karen, you go first. Oh, I was going to say, you know, basically if you, if you know somebody's home and you have to talk to them, you keep bang banging at the door. And, but that's exactly what we're doing. We're leaving a paper trail and, uh, you know, if they ignore one, then by golly, we're going to come up with another. And if they, uh, if we don't get the number of uh, signatures on a petition for, I don't know what reason, um, sometimes the petitions, the petition, petition sites, I think are sabotaged because uh, with my petition from September 2nd, I was told over and over and over again that uh, they, pe several people tried to sign it, but weren't allowed to, the site wasn't cooperating. So I don't know if that's usual or whether that's uh, on purpose. But then we keep trying. And I, I told people, I said, all right, I put out a petition. Um, you put out a petition. I'll sign and yours. And the other thing you know, is I also going. wanted to say every time. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut in. I'm being messed with again over here. So I didn't know that you were continuing to talk, uh, Karen. Sorry. Oh, no, please go ahead. Um, okay, the other thing that I was, um, th that this reminded me of is that several people have told me that they've approached city councils and they have approached local police. And all of these people, without exception, are getting labels of mentally ill, mentally unfit, and delusional being slapped on them by these people. And so these are city councils and these are local law enforcement who are doing this who are naming people when they are stepping forward to report that they are being stalked, sometimes stalked by police, sometimes stalked by fire station staff, sometimes stopped by, uh, stalked by e staff, you know, people with ambulances stalking them. Um, and sometimes whether on foot, on bikes or in cars. And this is around the country, you know, I'm thinking of various places. I'm thinking of the Midwest, I'm thinking of California. So, um, People in the city council, in fact, have written to one person who actually went before the city council and reported break-ins several times. 
And uh, she's been named delusional. And they actually wrote her a letter saying, we would not be able to respond to somebody who is delusional as opposed to somebody who is not delusional. Now, they didn't use those words precisely in how they said it, but they said, why would we listen to somebody whom we could, um, whom we could not fully consider fully reliable? when there are other important pressing matters to be taken off from those people whom we do see as fully reliable. So not only is she being seen mentally ill, she's also being discriminated against for being, in their understanding, mentally ill. Well, let me ask then, um, where did the city council get its degree in psychology? Yes, it's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Um, where, so where, where do uh, high school graduate deputies get their degrees in psychology? Where do um, beat um, <laughs> cops get their degree in psychology? Because um, I've, <laughs> you know, um, Florida deputies tried to Baker Act me when I sent, uh, I don't even know how many uh, links to the fact that this technology exists. And they tried to Baker Act me. Um, by deceit, you know, deception. And uh, I got there, the um, intake nurse talked to me and she said, ah, okay, whistleblower, we've seen that before. And then she talked to the psychologist and he, it was a Dr. Mitchell who worked for the state of Florida. And he said, get out of here, you don't belong here. Okay, so I go back home and of course I'm writing the Leon County Sheriff's Department email saying, nice try, you know, but it didn't quite work. Now, if we can quit fooling around, would you actually take a look at the links, have somebody who's actually, you know, technologically uh, gifted, maybe, or experienced, and have them take a look, and can we get down to serious business? And I was told later by a deputy, he said, well, I know you were dismissed, and uh, the doctor said that there's nothing wrong with you, but I disagree. Oh, really? Deputy Panasuea, you and your high school education disagree with a vetted and educated psychologist. Well, isn't that special? You know, and at that point in time after, um, I mean, at, at this point right now, um, <clears throat> with NSA's false psychological attack that they do on so many of their, their people at work, um, I've been vetted by four psychologists who say, nope, she's perfectly fine, uh, absolutely, totally um, in reality. She's not delusional, never has been, and not likely to be. But four psychologists don't beat one flat foot deputy, I guess, you know. So that's the, that's the whole thing is that, you know, the, the, if anybody even mentions the word crazy or psychological, psychologically impaired or something like that, it's like people run for the hills, you know. And, they, they, and the thing that strikes me is that people are not intelligent enough to speak with you and even think to themselves, Gosh, that sounds calm and rational, but I've been told that the person's crazy, so they must be. I've been it's, told with some, from by somebody with a badge who has no uh, knowledge of psychology that this person is crazy, so therefore they must be, because the badge knows all. The ever-seeing badge, you know. So it's, it's just ludicrous. Yes, and it's, it's ludicrous and highly instructive, actually, because... Um, when we take it apart, there are certain elements that we've seen before. So number one, I would say is that, um, I mean, I have seen this movie before in communist uh, Romania, uh, many aspects, but also this thing of lab labeling people one thing on or another and then justifying whatever they want justified is exactly what happened in Nazi Germany, where it was enough to call somebody a Jew and then you could do whatever you wanted with them. So now it's not calling somebody a Jew, but it's calling them crazy. And crazy is such a, I mean, in science, we usually have to go through pages and pages of analysis and, you know, sometimes years of work to actually prove something. But somehow in this pseudoscience, you know, of psychiatry, you could just label people in 15 minutes like they did or tried to do in Melanie's case. And, you know, their conclusions are sound, even though it's just blah, blah, no scientific measurements, but 15 minutes is enough. So 15 minutes, minutes of blah, blah <laughs> is enough for, you know, a sound um, scientific or medical opinion you know so called but it's of not of course it's not of course it's not <laughs> it's so, absolutely not and uh, yeah. um a really good psychologist or psychiatrist would admit that 
exactly and um and i think what we have to do is turn it around and say what we're saying here is a criminal operation um and once we we put that premise across we should say everybody who behaves like that is like the nazis they are criminals they are criminals um there's a yes, lot of them they gang and, up and, and the very and the fact of the matter really is as you know catherine um it's they are, in a sense, attempting to. Um, the, I'm trying. I'm using the word criminalize, but that's not the word I want. Really, it, they're trying to criminalize people who are reporting crime, people who are reporting covert implantation, people who are reporting break-ins at night, reporting gaslighting. You know, the movement of objects in their room, the removal of certain objects one at a time. You know, sort of negligible style burglaries, which is these are hallmarks of COINTELPRO hallmarks of intelligence agency clandestine operations. So people who are coming forward to report these kinds of clandestine actions and behaviors, which really the, the trail of crumbs leads right back to intelligence over there, to, to the military intelligence or to intelligence per se. You know, people who are coming forward in, in those ways are being named mentally ill. So literally mental illness, psychiatry is being used as a weapon it's being used as a weapon to neutralize these reports, to take them out of society, to keep journalists from listening to them, to keep doctors from listening to these people who are reporting crime. It, so psychiatry is a huge issue. Psychiatry is being extremely abused. Yeah. And you, you know, against it. society. You have said the key thing. Um, psychiatry is um, being used to stop people from reporting crime. And there's only one group of people who would have an interest in stopping people from reporting crime, and that's criminals. That's exactly right. So, um, you know, by induction, the people who are doing this, um, we can assume that they are criminals. Um, and I think we have to move to this stage now, and um, we have to take um, law enforcement into our own hands, which I don't mean shooting people in the street, which is uh, funny enough what the police seems to be doing. <laughs> yes, but no, that's not what I mean. Um, but I do mean um, finding a way to arrest them, finding a way to charge them, and actually finding a way to jail them, you know. Um, and we have to get back to that because the truth is that our systems have now been saturated by these with these criminals who behave like Nazis. And in fact, I can prove to you that exactly the same game plan is being played out just like in 1940s Germany. Because the same people who funded the Second World War also funding this global takedown operation and they're using the same. So we have to all wake up to the fact that what we are dealing with globally is a, is a huge Nazi takeover. And... Um, if you look up how the Nazis operated, I've got a book about the part of Munich that I used to live in and um, it describes the Nazi takeover of Munich and of that particular part of town, which ironically is just a kilometer away from the head of um, German Intel the headquarters of German intelligence. So go figure why that place might have been so incredibly Nazi. But anyway, so the, um, the place was taken over as follows. Um, number one, good police officers were either killed or put into retirement, or literally just mobbed out of the workplace. Now, does, that, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? So the police officers, by the end of this cleansing process, who were left in the system were Nazis. Then at the same time, they unified all the press, and um, all the press was um, only allowed to submit certain news articles. So this is information warfare. The people don't actually realize what's going on. So you're kind of meant to keep the crowd calm so that they don't start acting against you. So the press was unified and was only printing um, permitted statements. Does that sound familiar to anybody? You know, that's exactly what we have now. And then the other pillar was also all the, um, so Germany in the 1930s had a lot of um, like clubs or, you know, associations and things like that. You know, groups of people, um, of activists who were lobbying for this or that. And they, again, through a process of infiltration by um, intelligence informants and through a process of financial warfare and administrative warfare, they've eliminated associations and clubs. Um, and then the remaining ones were taken over. The leadership was taken over by Nazis and they were um, converted into, into one organism that was acting basically as an, as an arm of, of the Nazis in government. So, and... 
we see exactly the same thing. We see that victims who are, we might as well call Holocaust victims because this is what they are. The Holocaust victims are these days approaching um, the human rights charities, the media and the police, and none of them are acting. In fact, the police is actively attacking them like the Nazis would. Um, the media is ignoring all reports. And by the way, guys, in the UK, this includes The Guardian, and this includes Private Eye, who I've contacted myself, not just on one occasion. Okay, so these are two newspapers that are, you know, highly regarded in the UK um, of two different parts of the spectrum. But both of them, both of them actively ignore the fact that um, people are being mutilated to death in their own homes by MI5. People are being exterminated in individual concentration camps in the UK now and the British press is not reporting. Now, I think if we use the model from 1940s Germany, I would say it's because Private Eye and The Guardian is being run by Nazis. And yes, and that's right exactly right. By Nazis, you know. Yes, if you took, took, took it to the 30s, exactly. But that, you know, that's also the case in America. That's Absolutely. the New York Times. That's um, Vice. The Wall Street Journal. The Wall, the Street, Wall Journal. Street Journal, exactly. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, the Washington yeah. Post. Yes, these so, are all newspapers so we have newspapers. personal dealings with. Yeah, <laughs> so we know absolutely. And as you know, right? And you know, we've we've all had this. We've had this conversation a few times, but uh, literally, people who are targeted. One of the first things they do, and we are among that lot. We write to whom we have previously considered the top journalists in our country. You know. And also in, in the UK, I wrote to journalists um, at The Guardian and The Independent. I wrote to journalists at The New York Times. Um, I wrote to the uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation. I wrote to various people. You know, I wrote to a whole bunch of people. And uh, nobody responded. One person responded asking me to, to include my story in the bulk of, in the body of the email. And that was it. He did not respond after that, after he did get that. Um, so, And then the... the these guys have published, well, not precisely the journalists that you contacted, but some other journalists working for the same newspapers have published articles, you know, such as the famous one in the New York Times last year um, about uh, reporting victims being paranoid, uh, seeing stalkers behind every lamppost, etc., being delusional, being mentally unstable. Um, this is a mantra that's being repeated by them. It's very much a mockingbird mantra. It's very much a fed to them kind of mantra. And they quote in their articles certain sociologists and psychiatrists um, who also come out and say, oh, yes, this is mass delusion. This is mass paranoia. Nothing to see here. No radiologists, no physicists. No mention of the actual implants that have been found in people's bodies, of the number of people who have sued the intelligence agencies for by reason of being implanted. Nothing of that nature. You see, so very selective so-called reportage and extreme fabrication and extreme propaganda. So um, utter defamation and libel, really, because it's... Um, simply discounting the actual reports of victims. So this is very much like as if if this were, you know, 1940s or 1950s Germany even, it's people are coming forward to say, oh, look, I was in a concentration camp. This is what these people did to me. And, and they were disbelieved. You see, that's exactly what's going on. And actually, this brings to mind, you know, those famous plutonium radiation experiments. And um, this little piece of information that Eileen Wellsom, the journalist who who found out all about those radiation experiments and wrote about them, uh, what she shared. If you don't mind me screen, sharing my screen for one minute, I'll show you a little excerpt that I think is very opposite to this discussion. So, so here we go. So this is on my website, this article. And um, the name of this article, this is my, in the name of national security, Secret Classified Human Subject Experimentation and Research in 2015. Where is the public outrage? Obviously, I wrote it in 2015, but, you know, obviously that question still, still stands. It is 19, 2017 and nothing's been done yet. Um, so here we go. So um, this is the cover of Eileen Wellsom's book, The Plutonium Files. Now, she had an interview with Amy Goodman at Democracy Now! And she revealed during that interview that one of the prime um, people used in those plutonium radiation experiments of the 50s um, was called 
child a paranoid schizophrenic by his doctor. Here she says, the sad part and the tragic part about Elmer's story is that nobody believed him. He went to his doctor and told him, you know, I think I've been injected with something. His doctor diagnosed him. This is, you know, this is so classic. His doctor diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic. This you were losing your the... audio. Wait, yeah, we're, wait. We're his doctor losing. said he was a paranoid schizophrenic? Can you guys Just hear me? Okay. Um, I, we yes. lost your audio because you were going right to the heart of the issue. So it's um, it just fits the scheme yeah. every single time we, you know, you're, yeah, you're right about the time. Okay. Please I'm, just I'm, say everything again. You just say. All right. I'm experiencing a lot of audio. Yeah, you were saying that he went to the doctor and, the, and told the doctor he thinks that he thought he had been injected with something and the doctor just basically uh, dismissed it and, and, dis so, and basically um, said he was a paranoid schizophrenic. Sure. Which is ridiculous because why would, a, why would a psychologist, doctor or a policeman think, oh, you're speaking about something I have no knowledge of, therefore you must be crazy. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make any sense at all. And, and I you think know. by exactly and by now we have to we have to just um, face up to the fact that such behavior is so unusual. It's so irregular that it means there's an alternative explanation. It's not natural behavior. And I would say that the doctor was in on it. I think it's that simple. I think what actually happens is that when the intelligence agencies are conducting experiments, of course, they're going to track the, um, you know, the experiment, track the results and what it does to a person. And they will track, you know, the entire interaction with the doctor. So the first thing the intelligence agencies will do is go and um, twist the doctor's arm and say, you, you know, you will keep quiet about this. And you will just play along. I think this is what happened. And um, I think any intelligence agency that um, sets up large-scale um, testing like that, or any military, of course, it will then follow it all through and 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 try to cover their their asses, you know, from all angles. And going and and blackmailing um, and and threatening people is just part of the entire program. And I think this is a very very good example because as soon as you see um, such unusual behavior it implies there's an external force being applied to the person the person doesn't react the way you would expect them you to you would expect a free normal person to expect because either the person is normal as in their psychopath or the person isn't free and then you have to decide which of the two are maybe both you know it is so um i ramola can are you back oh dear oh, her, I, I, her icon is back yes um, you would think that somebody's doctor would know them pretty darn well. And if they came in with a story about, hey, I think I've been injected and this is what happened, that they would know from 5, 10, 15, 20 years of treating that person that they don't have delusions. And they should be familiar enough with psychology to know that people just don't become delusional overnight. And especially later in life, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, you just don't suddenly become delusional. You know, and I very much resent the equation of, um, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm stupid, so therefore you must be crazy. Yeah. You know, and so I think <laughs> that I think doesn't now, equate. Exactly. And I think now we have to ratchet on to, um, you know, up to the next phase of, um, of what we're going to do. And we have to collect these people who behave in such an irregular way. And we have to say um, what this means is that they've either been um, contacted or, or blackmailed or threatened by the intelligence agencies or they're in on it and they're going uh, and they are getting paid a lot of money. Um, I would say that this this is the case. And um, talking about money, um, you know, if if people cannot understand where this these sums are coming from, well, let me tell you that intelligence agencies are unusually well funded um, because they are they they their job is to blackmail, infiltrate, and sabotage everything. So the first thing that they'll do is you know infiltrate and blackmail such that they ensure their own money flows. But also on top of that, we have to remember that um, I think over forty trillion went missing from the US budget alone since the, um, I think the mid 1990s. And the question is, where is all this money? And I would, I would submit that um, this money is now funding the, the global war on the population. I think it's, um, you know, through probably front companies as always, um, is distributing money to gang stalking networks and, 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 and. But the point is that you can't move around 
money of you know quantities of money of that size physically or digitally without it showing up in the um, infrastructure so in other words um, i think all of these uh, money flows are being submitted through for example the bax system so the bank transfer system um, and all the other you know digital tra money transfer systems we have and in other words um, both the banks um, as much as the intelligence agencies that have access to all the data held by the banks know where this money has gone and who has it i think and that's what we have to face up to. The 43 tr or the 40 trillion didn't just get lost. It's now being distributed and now we have to go to the banks and we have to go to the intelligence agencies and say, um, I think you have to track this money and you have to get it back. Yeah. So I think as we're fighting this crime cartel, so basically what, where, where I'm heading with this today in today's show, because I really want, I want to talk about what is being done. I want people to understand the gravity and then, then I want people to finally take action. But this sentence of, oh, please all take action is too undefined. So most people have no idea what that means exactly. So let's just make it concrete. Um, what we need, I think, from the victims is that they all start making lists of people um, that they think are in on this criminal conspiracy or have been blackmailed to take part, coerced in one way or another. It doesn't matter. But we basically have to start um, a global Nazi hunt. We have to face up to the fact that, yes, this is an extermination program. Yes, the victims are put into individual concentration camps. Yes, the same old Nazi methods are being used, which is psychiatry by the way that's also what the nazis did you know the people were just considered you know psychiatric cases and locked up so it's exactly the same program okay it's exactly the same nazi program and by the way the same nazi takeover has now been played out and i think virtually every country of the world because when they were finished with the nazis then came vietnam where they, the cia was running death squads and then came latin america and africa and asia and basically by now there isn't a country on earth that hasn't gone through this nazi takedown program just you know under different guys and now i think all around the world wherever you guys are we're listening now it doesn't matter if you're in the us and south africa and japan or australia or in europe we all are facing up to the same nazi takeover and we all have to wake up and realize okay what we each one of us has to do is a criminal investigation what each one of us has to do is actually make their own qualifications insights and um you know maybe also um pro professional credentials count to stop this we all basically have to come together now the question is how and i would say what we will start doing from today onwards is number one i think we should advise all victims to make long lists of all the criminals involved in every part the police officers who denied them help the doctors who behaved oddly modified medical files or behave you know denied them help the people who were trying to smear them uh, slander them or libel them as um, psychiatric cases, they all go on the list because they're all part of this global Nazi criminal conspiracy. And it's hard, I, people on Twitter keep questioning me, oh, why do you call them Nazis? Because it's the same program and because the ideology is identical. They believe in their own superiority, they are ganging up on people, they're running death squads, they're exterminating people, they're experimenting on people against their will with horrific experiments that come straight from the death camps of Nazi Germany, and they experiment also on disabled people. What more do you need? You know, it, it satisfies all criteria for Nazi takeover. And we have to face up to the fact that, yes, a lot of people running our mainstream media are Nazis. They probably think it's a good thing that um, a fraction of the population are put into concentration camps. If they didn't think that, they would do something about it, one way or another. So, and also, sorry, the people who are running the charities, I mean, I called the major charities myself, and I was told over and over, oh, yes, we keep getting so many reports about people, um, you know, complaining about being shot at with microwaves. Oh, yeah? So at what point are you going to do something about it? You know, how many people need to turn up? 10,000? 2 million? But of course... Very well, good point. You know. And you know, you know the very fact that these human rights organizations are simply not showing, are not evidencing any awareness of human rights and not responding to the cries and the calls of the population.
you know, suggests to, should surely suggest to all of us that they are not really working as human rights organizations. They are being selectively focused on human rights in some cases and not in others, you know. And the reason that they become sort of the focus of our interest is because they have such a huge stature. Everybody knows them. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. ACLU, you know, they're supposed to stand up for civil rights, civil liberties, and human rights. And yet, when people go, and so many people individually go and complain, you get stories from ACLU like, oh, we can't look into individual cases. Yeah. We can only help groups. I mean, yeah. that's not really true. You know, if somebody's thrown off a plane or something, the ACLU is right there. Yeah. You're right? If there's some kind of physical concrete action, it's only now for the past 20 years when people are talking about stealth radiation weaponry, stuff that you can't see, but that surely exists because we have all of the documentation. We yeah. know the military has been developing it. We know the military is working with the DOJ. Yes. And, you know, and given also, that situation, you would think the ACLU would be interested. This is surveillance radar for that matter. You know, yeah. it's radar weapons that are being used by the police stations. Yes, and and also there's a there's this very simple um, argument from systems analysis, um, which is that um, if you're if you're operating a system, okay, any sort of system, it doesn't matter what it is, no system is going to run absolutely faultless. There will always be mistakes, you know. So, for example, if you have a factory production line, um, a factory owner who claims that his products come out perfect and there's no variation is a liar. So um, all factories are tuning their their machines, and you know if you have have five percent of goods that um, you know have some mistake. Um, that's actually a good thing. If you get it to down to one percent, that's brilliant. But you know you can you can push down the percentage, but the percentage was never ever going to be zero because of the laws of physics. It is just physically impossible. Okay. Now, when you have human systems, it's exactly the same story. Systems analysis doesn't specify what system it is. So this means every single human system by the laws of physics will have to produce some sort of errors, some sort of corruption of one form or another. Now, when you have people who claim that the system exists that produces no victims, that's a lie. That's just a lie. And in fact, you can take the size of the system and you can predict quite reliably how many you know, grave injustices and grave mistakes do you just expect, you know? So um, this argument can be used to totally blow out um, of the water, for example, the operation of the um, Investigatory Powers Tribunal in the UK. That's the specific dedicated court to look into um, abuses by the intelligence agencies, because I think over 10 years they managed to, I think they have about 10 cases where they thought that some injustice might have happened. British intelligence over 10 years producing only 10 injustices when the mobile phone or service providers or the, the phone service providers um, are producing 300 severe cases by day, you know, per day. So a national surveillance provider has to produce as many mistakes as a national telecommunication provider, at least, you know, and British Telecom is usually not in targeted sabotage, even though it feels sometimes like that. But in any case, when MI5 claim that they have no, no um, injustices or no problems, you can gauge the size of the cover-up. And again, you can use the same argument when certain types of weapons are produced. So we know that the entire German arms manufacturers deal in Rheinmetall, for example, dedicated to producing electromagnetic weapons. So the question is, where are the victims? Where are the victims? And if they claim, oh, there are no victims, every victim who comes forward is mad, well, where are the vi victims? <laughs> there have to be some. And, and we can you know the calculate how many we expect. Yes, and you know, you should also remember, at least definitely in this country, and I would imagine worldwide as well, you know, with the Snowden revelations and Glenn Greenwald coming out and saying, oh, we're going to reveal who is on those terror lists and those watch lists. And the next thing you know, Greenwald kind of retracts utterly and he doesn't reveal anything, but he publishes an article uh, highlighting five people and they're all Muslim and they're on these lists, you see? And then everything falls into a vacuum. The entire story of the lists 
and publishing who's on the list falls into a vacuum. So whether or not that information was indeed contained in that cache of Snowden's documents that he left the NSA with, nobody is to know because everybody's sitting on it. Those who supposedly have access to those documents are sitting on it and are not publishing it. Meanwhile, thousands of people all around the country and indeed all around the world, all around Europe, etc. And remember, the NSA, like the CIA currently, apparently is worldwide, has a worldwide presence. Um, people are coming forward to report the, the, um, the assault of electromagnetic weapons on their person and, um, and nobody bats an eyelid. Nobody adds two and two together and says, those lists, that connection, the war on terror, the Patriot Act, and people coming forward reporting surveillance abuse. Why don't we just call it surveillance abuse? Surveillance abuse with deadly weapons because isn't that what it is? And then it opens the gateway to all the darker ops, you know, the US Air Force and the US Navy, and um, who else, the Marine Corps, the Department of Energy, the Department of Justice, and the CIA, running MKUltra style neuro experimentation uh, tests on people, you know, with new deadly, dirty neurotech like V2K to torture them and to run seer torture scenarios inside their heads, as I've reported, you know, Chris Burton rep has recently reported, and various others. So you have to ask, why, why can't people make those connections, you know, between that historical timeline of when the coverage dropped off on surveillance, and nobody started to cover surveillance abuse. Nobody covered, you know, the reports of victims except the very small fraction of journalists in old media. I mean, possibly I'm the only one, I don't know. But <laughs> maybe there are others. But everything fell off, everything fell off. And the vast bulk of journalism just sort of walked away, stepped away, stopped reporting. Exactly. Stopped reporting reality. And I think, again, we have to say this behavior is normal because usually journalists are more than glad to have some sort of, you know, outrageous scandal or story. So what happened? There's some sort of... You would think that they would simply lap us up. It's a really juicy story. Thing. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh and um, the fact that they are, they are not doing that, we have to now dig around and, and say, what is the external influence? And there are two external influences. So one is a known mechanism in, in Britain. It's also publicly discussed. Um, it's called, in Britain, it's called denotices, I think. And it's um, where the Ministry of Defense um, or MI5 or, you know, whoever feels like it that day um, puts out um, a note, a denotice, and um, forbids the reporting on a certain topic. And then journalists are not only not allowed to report about that, they're not allowed to report about the fact that they have been forbidden from reporting about something. And as much as we have seen classification being misused, um, we've discussed that last time, how classification is prolifically misused in, um, in the intelligence agencies, I would say that also denotices are massively misused mm. because it's so easy to do so. It's a, it's a blanket gagging order. So how could a criminal possibly resist doing that, using that to cover up their crime? How could a criminal syndicate possibly, you know, um, refuse or, sorry, um, resist um, using that? So of course they're using that. So I think effect number one is um, the gagging orders. And I would say we as a society have to grow up and, and learn a bit about systems analysis and say, as soon as you have these blanket gagging orders and even classification, you have put in a mechanism for deep capture by design. You and you're permitting it. You know, society is permitting that deep capture. And you see, this is, if you, if you draw that analogy with, you know, the concentration camps and with what was coming out, the information coming out of Germany, the obvious uh, and the outcome of that analogy really is that we are in a war situation. We are in a situation of extreme crisis today. We have people reporting extreme assault on their bodies and journalists who possibly may be gagged, as you say, by that kind of denotice from the intelligence agencies, you know, who are gagged from reporting. Journalists, those journalists are playing into the scenario that's been set up, the criminal scenario that's been set up here. So in other words, they are permitting continued access, as Karen has said at one point, uh, they are permitting continued access to the victims 
by the intelligence agencies and by the military groups that are running these deadly weapons experimentation assaults on them. Yes, yes, they are. Absolutely. And um, what, where that leads us is exactly what um, Catherine Austin Fitz, Fitz suggested, which is we need to take the press to court for criminal conspiracy. Um, so being part of a criminal conspiracy for, um, you know, um, aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. Absolutely. And there are two cases. Number one, it's um, those people who are maybe honest, but are gugged by the notices. Well, at some point, we have to get back to this legal principle that uh, Karen pointed out, that you can't use classification to cover up crime. So as soon as you have prolific crime um, of a military organization or intelligence agency against their own people, um, the entire concept of classification and, and gagging orders and denotices becomes a mechanism to, um, to propagate this crime and therefore those, um, those rules have to be null and void. Because what you actually, what you have is you are, have a mechanism to cover up high treason, which is nonsensical. So the mechanism has to be removed and we have to make, we have to get this point across and it has to be recognized as a legal principle. You can't use something flimsy, something written down on a piece of paper to justify the killing of people. You know, the, the entire Third Reich had, um, you know, the, the, the uh, sorry, Fourth Reich, whatever, whatever you, whatever way you count it. I think so, it was the Third Reich and we're living in the time of... Exactly, the Fourth, fourth Reich. Reich. I, I, I lost track because, exactly because of that. Also, how do you count which world war are we in now? I, I don't know, do you count the Cold War? So it doesn't matter. The entire Nazi empire, they have justified absolutely everything they did with a legal mechanism. But that doesn't make it lawful. That doesn't make it right. So we have to take a lot of these statutes and rules and just throw them out. Absolutely, yes. And, and, and ultimately, the, the, the argument is to say that what this leads to is an unconscionable process. It's an unconscionable law. It's null and void. So I would say by now, we have to face up to the fact that um, classification, it just leads to deep capture. And we have to get rid of classification. We also have to get rid of these need notices. And I invite all the journalists who are listening to this or might listen to this to one day um, to just go up against these need notices and to realize that if they do not, they are aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. They are aiding and abetting death camps in the UK, in Germany, in Switzerland, in the US, and everywhere else in the world. They're permitting the death camps to continue. They're permitting these kinds of inhumane assaults to continue. They're giving the intelligence agencies and the military groups running these weapons tests carte blanche to go ahead to maul, mutilate, and destroy people wholesale, to destroy their lives, to destroy their relationships, their friendships, their families, their employment, to blacklist them, and to destroy them physically. So literally, in our midst as societies in the 21st century, we have people whose bodies are being assaulted and destroyed, whose brains are being assaulted and destroyed. And because the weapons are stealth weapons and radiation weapons, and because the weapons are neural weapons, they cannot be seen, but they are most definitely in play. And in fact, as we know, and as we've you know, tried to lay out over time, there has in fact been set up a huge control grid what some people call an electronic control grid, a whole system, a whole system of mechanisms by which these weapons are being used, ground-based, land-based, air-based, space-based, etc. You know, all yes, of these absolutely. platforms, straight out of a military and, manual. Well, people have to extrapolate when you have one situation where they refuse to see the, you know, what's going on, you know, with hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, we're not quite sure how many people are in this, maybe a million or two worldwide, we don't know. But if you are saying, well, logically, this is happening to all kinds of people, so it's okay, because it's equal opportunity abuse. I mean, that's what they're saying. Because if you and I came to any of these organizations and said, you know, this is being done to Chinese people or Americans of Chinese descent, or this is being done in India, to people who are from the northern, northern part of India, but not the southern. Or if you say it's from the Hungarian part of Romania, but not the, you know, the whatever, you know. Uh, people get outraged because you're picking out one type of person to 
viciously abused, but they seem to just blow it off like, oh, well, as long as whites and blacks and Orientals and Hispanics are all being mutilated, it's fine. So that's just insane. It's absolutely insane. Well, it I was is. going to. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I was all, I was also going to say, I'm just going to read the last uh, paragraph of the letter that I wrote to the Florida uh, State Attorney General. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, you have, you now have been alerted to monumental crime ubiquitous in your state. Your constituents expect you to act to restore law and order. You have the right to declare a state of emergency and call out the National Guard to go house to house, car to car if needed, to confiscate these contraband weapons of war that are actually classified as weapons of mass destruction according to 18 U.S. Code and are forbidden to be used by civilians and are forbidden to be used on non-combatant armed civilians. The Constitution is clear. Your duty is clear. There is no constitutional crisis unless you allow it on your watch. So that's how this, uh, this letter to Pam Bondi and any other attorney general people want to send it to, that's how it ends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I, think, um, I think also um, the next logical step is that if he doesn't act, um, we will, um, it follows directly that he is part of the conspiracy. So he has to be removed as one of the criminals. Um, and we have to face yes, up I this because I, I think I, I know it's also evident that certainly in Europe, every single attorney general has been notified. So I... Yes, and I... Perhaps I'm just echoing your own thought, Catherine, but I think what you were saying, actually, you're pointing out that those, those people who are not responding are, in a sense, fully implicating themselves currently by not responding. Yes, I, that's exactly what I would say. And um, I think... Where this is heading, although we won't do it now because I have other projects to um, to launch, where this is heading is that we'll restart the Tsunami email campaign, which was exactly this mechanism of putting people on notice and then when they don't act, take them to court. Um, and we will restart that, but there are a couple of um, other things that we're doing in the meantime that take all our attention at the moment. Um, but I think exactly, and I'm so pleased that you um, did that, Karen, because by putting him on notice, we can, it's basically like you, 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 you start the time running, the time's ticking from that moment onwards. And then we can go to court to, um, at a later time and say, this attorney general has not acted to protect the population. He, he actively ignored the warnings, which means that he took a decision to aid and abet these crimes. Um, and oh, oh, these which implies that he or she, in this case, I think it's a she, I, which also implies that perhaps she is part of the network that is exactly. organizing these crimes against civilians. Exactly, and it would make sense because the organized crime cartel that does this, um, which is the same organized group that has, um, you know, staged the Second World War and staged other wars, um, is operating exactly like that. Of course, they are corrupting the attorney generals first. Of course, they're going for key positions who you would have to use in order to stop them. So they buy them up first. They corrupt them first so that you can't actually use that um, part of your institution. You can't use that mechanism. And um, this is classic deep capture. And for deep capture, there's a certain process to, to regain the system. It's very laborious, but we have to start it now. And we have to think about it in terms of these systems and to think where are the key positions. It's, for example, the attorney general who would have a duty to act also in the name of the population, not just in the name of the government. And when the attorney generals do not act, it means that they have been corrupted. So this means immediately that they have to be removed and they also have to be jailed. They have to be jailed. Um, not just removed. And I make, I, I stress this because if you just remove them, what you'll end up with, and this has been observed over and over, is this um, uh, revolving door of attorney general. So one attorney general pops out of your system. You don't jail him. There are no consequences. So they typically, typically go off and become, you know, get a very high paying job in the network of corporate control, this organized crime cartel. And then the next person comes in, dabbles around a bit for a year or two without doing anything. And then they get ejected out. You know, and it becomes like a little two-year job that you do, being at the attorney general, keeping the, you know, the, um, the people at bay so that they can be tortured to death. And then you get a really cushy job. Now, 
I, th- I would say that you see, you see this pattern over and over, and that's exactly what you would expect if you just look at you know, the system. So what you have to do is you have to cut this flow. You have to cut the reward flow, and that means every attorney general who doesn't act to stop these crimes against humanity needs to go to jail as a Nazi, as a Nazi or a Nazi collaborator, because that is what they are. And the same thing has to be done, I would say, with the journalists. It's not good enough to just um, slap them on the wrist. No, we have to. And, and the reason why it's not good enough is because we need the press back fast. This is information warfare. And people can be you murdered know, and mutilated in large numbers because the information does not flow through the population that these crimes are going on. I think we will get our press back, uh, Catherine, but I don't think we are going to get those journalists back. I think every single journalist who has betrayed humanity, you know, does not deserve that platform that they have currently. And they have that platform currently because the, the newspapers who are employing them, you know, the media outlets that are employing them are all sustained and supported by the cartel. Yes, exactly. And, and exactly. And um, quite specifically, so for, for example, where you were talking about that New York Times article um, that was, um, you know, defaming the victims, um, you called it, I, I have to, I forgot the exact word, but you called it, I think, a mockingbird action or something like that. And I would say it's an Operation Mockingbird action. For those who don't know, let me just share my screen and inform you what Operation Mockingbird is. And this was or still is, I would say, a large-scale program of the CIA that began in the 1970s and attempted to manipulate news media for propaganda purposes. It funded student and cultural organizations and magazines as front organizations. So Operation Mockingbird, more generally, is the infiltration of of the print media and the media in general. So TV stations, uh, magazines, but also newspapers, cultural organizations... Um, I would say also um, book prizes and so on and so on. So Operation Mockingbird is a real thing. And I don't think that any of these CIA uh, projects, just like MKUltra, have ever been switched off. They've oh, just no. Been expanded. And in fact, it's, they've only expanded, haven't they? They're yeah. everywhere, right? The CIA is everywhere. They pride themselves on being everywhere. Absolutely. And um, so I think the second mechanism um, for 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 the gagging of journalists. Number one was um, the D-notice. You know, if you've got an, an honest journalist or editor, but he can't report because he got the D-notice slapped on, um, on him. And these people are afraid that if they go up against the D-notice, that they will be in court and locked away for life, you know, on grounds of national security. Now, we have to crack that open. And we have to say, when you are in a situation of deep capture, national security becomes a national threat because a crime cartel is killing you off and because of some administrative little, you know, pieces of paper, you let yourself be killed off because you say, oh, this piece of paper says I have to hold my hands like this, like bound together, even though nothing binds my hands. But I ha- I'm told I have to hold them like this whilst you, you're killing us. So let me just do that. This is what it is. I want to also give you one little piece of one little anecdote about how uh, journalists are being kept out of real reportage. You know, yesterday I called... Um, Barnier Center, which is the place where Rohini Basesar is being held. Uh, she is the woman who was accused of stabbing another woman and killing her, and uh, who has spoken out about being possibly chipped, brain chipped, and experiencing all sorts of strange ne- neurotech assaults in her brain, which she says made her do it. And which, so by that means, she came to my attention and to the attention of various others of us who are aware of these neurotech issues. Um, you know, and I tried to cover her story quite a bit. Um, a little bit earlier this year and last year as well. So apparently the latest with her is that she had a court appearance. She appeared looking dreadful and um, she made some statements to, to, to convey that she was being treated very badly. This is the Canadian jail system in Toronto. So um, she said that, you know, she was being held in a cell with 24-7 lights on. And she was being fed very scantily, not on a regular schedule. Sometimes she wasn't fed at all. And the person who reported this to me, who was at the court, said that she also looked very sickly. So I called the the Vanier Center to find out what was going on. I could not get through. You know, they said they would not speak to press. A shift supervisor finally uh, got to me and said um, he was not going to speak to press and that I would need to call 
um, the Ministry of Corrections, I think. Yeah, uh, some some person at the Ministry of Corrections to to find out. I said okay, and then he then you know this is very interesting, and this is what I wanted to report. Um, I mean, a very authoritarian fashion who I was. And, you know, I, I free, just freely give my information when I'm calling somewhere to get information as, as a media person. And so I was happy to give him my name and tell him I was from the Everyday Concerned Citizen. But I thought it was very interesting, the, the tone that he took as he asked for my name and where I was from and who I was. Because, you know, literally, he didn't need to. He'd already established that I was press. He'd already given me the information to go somewhere else for, for information, right? He didn't need to stay on the phone and say, and who are you? What is your name? And where are you from? So I'm wondering if that is a way to scare off journalists who call and try to get information, you know, in cases like this. I, I think it is. Sounds I like think, it. yes. And I think what we should realize is that, so Operation Mockingbird, what it did is that it placed... Um, agents also into like um <coughs> like luke harding <coughs> maybe at the guardian <coughs> did i say that so um these are full-blown agents they are trained by the intelligence agencies they're a bunch of bloody agents and they're pretending to be journalists now the point of a question like that is that if you're um, a journalist and you're integrated in, into this um, intelligence cartel if you are if you step out of line Asking where you're from and your name will mean that, you know, this will be sent, sent back to head office and whoever's your handler will come down on you. So that's the point. I think that's it exactly. I kind of got that feeling as I put the phone down. You know, as you said, there are agents everywhere. So do you think there are agents in, you know, these departments of corrections? Are they in prisons as well? I mean, it's, Ramona, like it's, called the, it's called the Department of Corrections. It doesn't get any more valiant than that, you know. Really? <laughs> no, I actually <laughs> asked to speak to Roni like to say something. Yeah, the woman at the, the front desk said, you know, this is a maximum security prison. You can't talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's the same, you should be fine, you know, giving us information because, you know, you know should be safe. <laughs> That's a good point so, for next time. <laughs> what do you, what do you restrict them from using certain words, you know? <laughs> You know, astonishing, isn't it? The whole thing. So obviously, I have to follow up on the story. Uh, else, how you know, find another means of getting information and getting through to Rohini Basesar, because clearly she is being abandoned in this jail and she's being abused in a in the Canadian jail system all over again. Yes. I already reported, you know, abuse in the Canadian jail system in her in her case earlier this year, and now it looks like I have to investigate, explore, and report it again. Actually, I. Yes, they don't learn because, and I think this is also something that we, we discover over and over. There seems to be this obsessiveness and, and just like a bunch of out of control morons, they just keep going. It's like, it's literally, it's like, sometimes it feels like being zombie slayers because these people just go, and they just don't freaking stop. Literally, they don't have a brain. And we have to realize the reason why it feels like such a zombie fest is because these people have bits missing in their brain. So the people at the top are psychopaths and they just keep going because they've got bits missing in their brain. Like we, we showed this MRI of the psychopath, what it looks like modules are not activated. So they just keep going like, you know, a herd of wildebeest. And um, yeah. I think, and, and actually the other thing I was thinking of is that um, the, um, the case of Rani also uh, mirrors one-to-one -one the case of Melanie Shaw in the UK. She was a whistleblower who blew the whistle on child abuse. And then, lo and behold, she was locked up herself. This is a petite little woman who's reporting about heavy, organized crime, and she's being locked up in a high-security prison. She was held in solitary confinement. Total ridiculousness. I couldn't get um, find out who the judge was who ordered that. I couldn't find the judgment, nothing. So we have to step back and say, hang on, hang on. This pattern seems to be, you know, cropping up over and over. What does it mean? And I would say what it immediately means is that both Melanie Shaw and both Rani are victims of the intelligence agencies. And how? Well... One of them involves illegal implantation, which is what the intelligence agencies do. The other one um, is about pedophile rings in the UK. And it seems to be, I think, slowly uh, we find out that it might be the case 
that MI5 is running those pedophile rings. MI5 is the, the big organized crime uh, syndicate in the UK, and it seems to be running the pedophile rings. And suddenly, as soon as you take that as your work, working hypothesis, everything makes sense. Suddenly, you can explain how whistleblowers who are blowing the whistle against, um, you know, the child abuse or pedophile rings or anything to do with that, um, get taken to pieces and are sometimes killed by methods that are, you know, strongly redolent of special branch and are taken apart in the jails by methods that seem to imply sometimes also attacks with um, directed energy weapons through the, the, the walls of their cell and, and, and. So we should say it, it means that those are victims of the intelligence agencies. I, I think we do have to look very closely at the whole child protection services racket, you know, and yeah. there are people who've come forward and everybody who's come forward, as you've noted, ends up with something horrific happening to them. You know, Melanie Shaw Lyra is May. in solitary confinement in a maximum Lyra security May. prison. There's... Let's say that out loud again, Karen. Myron May. Myron May in Tallahassee, My... Florida. Myron May was targeted extremely to the extent that he was involved himself in some kind of attack with guns and was killed in a shootout with police. Um, there are many others, you know, I think someone sent us a note about one of the Senate, some senator who actually spoke out and I'm blanking over here, Catherine Shaw, I, I forget her last name, I forget her name exactly, I'll have to look it up, but basically there's some senator from, I think maybe Louisiana, who spoke out in Congress and she was murdered, she spoke out about the child protection services racket, seven yeah. centers that video, and we have to yes. look at that. So maybe we I, need to do a real close focus on the whole child protection yeah. services racket. Well, I hate to interrupt, but I have to go. Um, so I will watch the rest of this <laughs> and, and see where it goes. But uh, thank you guys very much. And sorry to bug out a little bit too soon. But thank you. You guys take thank care. You. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. We'll see you next week, Karen. All righty. Bye-bye, Karen. So um, one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about um, is... Um, uh, Actually, we're absolutely right, and we said that in the past, and more and more evidence keeps accumulating that the people who are um, the victims of the intelligence agencies and report um, directed energy weapons and um, attacks and um, um, illegal implanting seem to be treated or rather mistreated in exactly the same way as the people who report about pedophile rings and child abuse. So Correct. it means that whoever's attacking them, they're operating the same way, or they're even the same people. And no matter how we're turning and twisting in which country we're going in, we seem to be ending up at the intelligence agencies every single time. So I think we should make it our working hypothesis that the intelligence agencies are behind it all. And suddenly, you know, it all falls into place. Sorry, by the way, I should say that today mm -hmm. I've got extreme difficulties um, thinking, ordering my thoughts, and even speaking and forming words. I'm not sure how noticeable this is, but that's because my head is being irradiated like I can't describe. Oh, so it feels like, and I want people to know that this is what's happening most of the time when we are online, sometimes when we talk on Skype, but especially when we're on the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. But mm. currently my head, because of the radiation, the direct shots into my head, and also this entire network of chips that's on my skull, it makes it the currents on my head make it feel like it's being crushed from the outside mm. and literally I can barely hold the thought. So it takes me extraordinary difficulties, um, um, you know, to actually even formulate sentences. That's what oh, but Catherine, you're exceptional do. because obviously to everybody watching, you're incredibly articulate and verbally adept as always. It's very hard to tell from our end. <laughs> Just well, my watching. thoughts are a mess. I mean, you know, you can see the contrast. I had, I had so many things I wanted to tell people today and now I'm just, I'm sometimes I'm just rambling because I, I just lose my thoughts. So <laughs> to, to counter that, I w wanted to very quickly um, just say a couple of things that I really wanted to um, put into this episode today because um, I think we need to now launch into individual cases and start investigating um, under the, the aegis um, or the, the, the topic of um, intelligence agency crimes. Um, and we need to expand even out, so out from just directed energy weapons and illegal implanting into child protection issues and even in that area say that these people might be victims of the intelligence agencies as well. You know, so, so that's one thing. And then another thing I really wanted to um, say today in this episode is also um, 
under the topic of what the hell to do okay because um, you, Ramola, and I, we, we are forced, we are immediately forced to do something because we are being killed in our own homes. Um, but there are a lot of people whose help we need um, who are not in constant pain like we are, um, who don't have to, for example, um, just to explain to people what my life looks like, I'm working full time trying to help victims and stop the attacks against me. Meanwhile, I have to be in a shielded room and I just uh, brought, bought professional shielding for about a thousand um, euros because the shielding I have is not thick enough to withstand the onslaught of these military weapons. I'm being machine gunned with pulsed energy projectiles all the time. They are so intense. they. They produce loud bangs um, as they bounce off metal shielding. Um, now, for the past two and a half weeks, ever since I came back from Brussels, I'm sleeping every night in the bathtub, and I have to put shielding over my head, and nevertheless, I'm listening to the nonstop machine gunning all throughout the night. So, and I'd like to point out to anybody who's listening that everything that Catherine is uh, informing the world about um, can be backed up and corroborated and can be recorded on a meter can be caught in a spectrum analyzer or can, be, or can be caught even on a microwave electrosmog detector. Absolutely. And I have put um, already videos up showing and demonstrating that you can hear these shots. You can see them put dents into aluminum. They are so intensive and holding up a measuring device that, by the way, since has been stolen, you know, you can even hear them through a meter as well. So there's a video out there. But also I'm nonstop being hacked. Um, Every single time I leave the house, or virtually every single time, my house gets broken into um, and they become ever more rude and outrageous about what they take. So just before I went to Brussels, they broke into my home. I had my suitcases packed and they, they stole three measuring devices that I needed in Brussels, specifically those. So this shows that this is the intelligence agencies who are listening into my phone calls, who have been listening into private conversations inside my home for the last couple of years. Um, and they are doing target, targeted sabotage. But also, people have to understand that we are being physically shot into nonstop. So in my flat, the half my flat I cannot use because it has big windows. I haven't spent more than even 10 or 20 minutes in it for over a year in my own flat because the assault weapons that are um, parked at my neighbor's homes are so intensive that you literally get machine gunned in those. So this is the hot shooting war we're up against now. And I'd like and to say, you know, in, in that context of, you know, actually spelling out how we are being hit. And, you know, I, I can echo quite a bit of what you are talking about, Catherine. I'm also hit quite, quite continuously, especially in my heart and in my head and in my face. And my computer is attacked horrendously continuously. As you know, I've been having major computer issues the last few days. And um, yesterday I was on a podcast with Dr. Eric Karlstrom, as I was telling you earlier, and my, my PC was knocked out. And I put a little bit of shielding around again around the computer and I know people have you know come out of the woodwork to tell me it's pointless using shielding around your com computer um, you know the NSA has got you on their networks they can stop your broadcast anytime so just shielding your computer is not going to help well I don't know it seems like yes I know the NSA has got me on my on, on their networks all the time the CIA and who knows else who knows who else um, and no doubt they're watching me on a big screen TV somewhere at this point in time but they are also able to physically assault my uh, my equipment where I sit. And I got proof of that yesterday during the podcast or just before we start the podcast. I put a little bit of shielding over the computer and I heard a very sharp hit right on top of the shielding just at the point where I could drain the power button is. So in other words, like it was something like an EMP hit designed to, to shut down my machine and over and over again as it as has happened in the past leaving me thinking it was my machine breaking down oh no it wasn't it was just an external hit exactly. so there is a value to external oh absolutely and and all the people who say that shielding doesn't work are typically agents who don't want you to protect yourself so that you can be mutilated to death it's literally that simple you know it's it's like it's like the nazi death camps who would say oh don't use a gas mask just breathe in the mustard gas you know oh right That's, yes exactly it's exactly right. that 
it that does make you happen. wonder, you know, where those people are coming from who are telling me, don't shield, don't use foil, because then you project this image of not being credible yourself. And uh, we all see the foil behind you, Catherine, and we know that it is there for a reason. Oh. It's there to shield. On, so, on, that, on that topic, can I, for those people who haven't seen us in a long time, can I just show you what my room looks like? That's my office. <laughs> It's also the bookcases behind have shielding. And you know why? Because that's the only way I can even exist in my own study. And this is how I lived for over a year now. Because if I don't have this metal shielding, and by the way, I have got extra thick shielding panels in the hallway in a direct line to a neighbor who lives diagonally across who is machine gunning me day and night. When I go into my kitchen through the door frames, I get hit like you can't believe. And um, if I don't have this military grade shielding around me towards my neighbors, I couldn't be able to survive in my own study. So this is what I mean by yeah. direct hot war. And by the way, also, I want people to know that there's no mystery about who the Nazis are who are doing this. In my case, here in Switzerland, the person who does that to me is Marcus Seiler. It's this man. Because Marcus Seiler is the head of Swiss intelligence. This is his doing. Marcus Seiler is authorizing my machine gunning here in my own home. And now, guess what? After he's been doing that for two years, this man is being rewarded because he now is going to become the general secretary of the foreign ministry. Okay? So, guys, what the hell does that mean? We've got a head of an intelligence agency that's running Nazi extermination camps. And then he's going to become something to do with the foreign ministry. Hmm. I would say that the foreign ministry is involved. This is a global program, and therefore the entire conduit goes through the foreign ministries, the foreign intelligence agencies, and so on and so on. And I think this is why this guy can just migrate from be being the head of Swiss intelligence to doing something in the foreign ministry because it's the same conglomerate, the same animal. And he seems to be rewarded. And I think it's Yes, and I think what's going on is, you know, these intelligence agencies who are indeed engaging in these crimes of co COVID implantation and weapons testing. Um, and also military groups. Let's not leave, leave out the military, the military and intelligence agencies that are doing this. They seem to think they can get away with it and they seem to think they can keep on doing it by using their, you know, age old um, methodologies of, of hiding with cover stories in addition to having completely taken over media, um, the cover stories of psychiatry, that every reporting victim is delusional and psychiatrically unstable. And uh, so, you know, I think that's something as, as well that needs to be highlighted and emphasized to, to show the methodology by which they continue these deadly covert operations and which any reasoning and humane society uh, on the face of the planet should abhor and uh, you know, really work hard to to um, to terminate. Exactly, and I, I this would... is the end of all. There's nothing civilized about permitting a group of people in your midst to be targeted and abused with weaponry. Exactly, and and I think if I if I may just emphasize once more that this is exactly the methods of the the, the Nazis. So this um, you know um, false um, psych psychiatrization. Sorry, here my speech impediment. You can't have your head on the current and then still have you know your brain impulses going. Um, so it's exactly the methods of the of the Nazis, and um, what it shows. So. Again, we have to now turn it around and say what happened to Frederic Laroche was actually a takedown operation by this criminal Nazi cartel. You know, what happened to our yes. colleague, and it's still happening and ongoing um, with Melanie, um, is, is basically that um, she was also the victim of a criminal takedown operation based on Nazi uh, methods by Belgian intelligence. They were trying to put her into psych psychiatry. Now they're trying again and they keep trying. And people really, really have to get their head around that the situation we're in now is extremely, extremely urgent. So um, for example, just um, not that long ago, I spoke to somebody who was saying, well, you know, I am uh, 
I, I, I'm aware of this, um, these problems. I'm being attacked myself. Um, my family and I were being attacked um, in very similar ways to you. But um, I'm now, I have to decide if I speak up or not because I'm running a company. Um, and I would like to say to that, you have to speak up and you have to kick into action. You can't just sit there and say, oh, just because you know you still have a job or you have a job in government or you have this or that or good, good income or you're just about to launch a company, you're not going to go up against it because your company and whatever you stand for and whatever you do will not be there unless we stop this criminal Nazi takeover. Just as much like in the 19, late 1930s, people could still hold on to their jobs, but very quickly an entire war followed that made everything impossible. So you can't, you can't just, it, it, this is not something you have to ponder. You have to go all out and fight this Nazi takeover. You can't just sit there and say, oh yes, but I, I don't really want to put myself into danger. And the reason, sorry, Ramo, like, hi, you're back. I'm just going to finish my thought oh, because I realized that thank you, you dropped out. Yes, yeah, keep talking. Because and, and I was, I was just I'm... making the point that some people are still thinking, oh, I don't want to wade into this because, um, you know, I don't want to be targeted. And I'm making the point that just as much as when the Nazis started taking over and started killing people in the late 1930s and so on and so on, um, you could still have, you know, clung to your job and your, your company and your, you know, whatever, your life plans. But within a very short time period, that became impossible because an entire huge war was kicked off. So really what people have to think is they have to look at us and realize that we are the battlefront. We are now literally the direct, you know, the, the border between the, the um, other side and, and our side and humanity. And if they don't join us where we are now, and if they don't join us right now and help us, then these cases will be lost. We will be killed off. We will fall. We won't have an income. And then the battle line will be even further um, and closer to them. I think this is what people have to realize. So Yes, I, exactly. And that's a great point to stress, actually, you know, the, that reporting victims of this day and age, of this time period, of this present moment, who, who include us, you and I, and, you know, everybody else who is being hit right now, we represent the current front lines. And if we are knocked out of action and society continues to stay uninformed, thanks to the lunacy of mainstream media not reporting this, and thanks to the deliberate and strategic negligence of the human rights organizations who have been approached, then this situation obviously will only continue and the advantage is going to be given to those guys with the weapons who are conducting these operations and who will continue to expand their circle of operations and simply take over and repress the entire population. So what better time to address this issue than now? Absolutely. When people are indeed speaking out, and people are still alive and have a voice to speak out, despite the fact that they keep getting bumped off the broadcast, as you saw just now. I think yeah. this was the, literally the fifth or sixth time I was bumped off the broadcast. I don't know if you noticed, but earlier I was completely bumped off as well. Um, especially when I was doing the Eileen Wilson thing, you know, I was showing them the Elmer Allen story. Exactly. I mean, I noticed that your audio is being um, cut off and, and, and played with, I should say played with, because so many times we um, also observe a harassment pattern, especially when we're talking on Skype. So it doesn't look like a normal computer error. It has some odd behavior. By the way, um, so what I wanted to also say, I wanted to um, give people a, a couple of, um, you know, little news and indica indications of how you can start collecting evidence, because the big plan is the following. So this is now the, the, the war plan, the battle plan. As far as I'm concerned, um, the last port of call is really court cases. We either pull up this plane, this crashing Boeing 747 that we're all on, um, now at the stage of court cases where we all come together, we look at the evidence and very calmly and rationally we say, yes, this huge war machinery has been built up by a group of organized criminals and let's just remove them in a civilized way from office. Should that not be possible because the judges are either Freemasons or have been corrupted or just refuse to grant victims justice, 
then what will happen is that this organized crime cartel will gain even more ground. Every judgment um, against the victims will be used as a precedent and it will be used to accelerate the system. It will be used to pour petrol on this burning fire. It will accelerate the Nazi machinery. So this is it. So we have to very quickly start putting on the brakes. And um, <clears throat> that's also why people have to help us now as opposed to next week or next month. Because every month that we lose, you have to realize that what's being done around me, for example, is that hundreds of young people, young Nazis, the new Hitler youth, are being trained up in the use of weapons. I'm the guinea pig, but they are training up hundreds. And these, these are genuinely death squads. And these death squads will be set loose on the rest of the population. And the actual name of the game yes, is to absolutely. go after high uh, Sorry. Sorry, Catherine. It seems like your audio at my end and your video has been with and um, at this moment I see I'm being frozen as well so I don't know if my video my audio is going through um, but the but if it is <laughs> the, um, the the only thing that I wanted to say was that we also have to look at the methodologies by which these death camps are being kept in place and a primary methodology a primary weapon is the use of psychiatry and uh, I think so therefore I think as criminal investigators we need to look at psychiatry very closely we need to take psychiatry apart because literally psychiatry is being used as a deadly weapon against people you know it's being used in the case of Melanie Richen where her baby is still being kept from her and um, that is such a decision I know that as soon as we get off this podcast we're going to be that um, and it's being used in so many other people's cases. Yeah. Anybody who reports this crime is being uh, is being hit with that weapon, the weapon of abuse of psychiatry. So I think it's time once and for all for the entire world to to bring down psychiatry, you know, to to open up psychiatry, to see, to look closely at what it's doing, to denounce the extremities and abuse that's being committed, and to score it out, you know out of the, um, the cash of allowed active our societies. Exactly. And I think what we should do, um, I just would like to suggest it, that um, next week we focus on psychiatry and we do exactly that. We just take it down. Um, and we just, we Great should... Idea. We should also start putting out um, information material and, and um, certified documents that we certify as JIT that people can use to um, slap down these psychiatrists individually. Because yes. we do now and have we do, all... Sorry. We do have some wonderful, um, uh, very aware, intellectually aware and um, psychologically aware um, psychologists who have stepped forward to speak out for those who are reporting these kinds of radiation crimes and COVID implantation crimes. And, um, you know, we do need to keep up. We need to publish them and to make them available to everybody so that people are not in positions of vulnerability when they go exactly. to hospitals and they report being hit with radiation. Exactly. And, and also, I think we should, we should start bringing criminal charges against psychiatrists who've been lying. And I think yes. the first batch of criminal charges will be against the psychiatrists at Hospital Erasmus in Brussels, who um, are holding um, our colleague's baby hostage and are smearing and libeling and defaming our colleague Absolutely. in the most criminal Absolutely. fashion. And I think what we should yeah, do is I take think what's going... I think we can safely conclude at this point, having investigated, explored, tried hard to address the situation at Erasme Hospital, I think we can safely conclude that what's going on is a criminal operation. Yes, absolutely. I think this is, this is exactly it. And um, I think we can also safely say that it's a criminal operation that um, victims have been experiencing when they went to the police and were smeared with psychiatric um, you know, um, illnesses. For example, I noticed that the cantonal police in um, Zurich, so um, uh, um, the, the police of the um, canton of Zurich, they submitted um, over and over when I reported uh, the break-ins, I submitted evidence of the break-ins. Every single time they made um, a report to the uh, mental health service here in the canton um, telling them that the police suspected that I had psychologically changed. 
Now, this is absolute bullshit. It, it would be down to the total imbecility of these officers were it not and the same pattern all over the world, at which point we have to say it's exactly. a criminal conspiracy. It is. It is a criminal conspiracy because when did law enforcement become, you know, psychological professionals? Exactly. So I have got a list of um, police officers who I think um, are part of this criminal conspiracy. And we ha all have to start generating these lists and we have to start um, removing these people individually and, and literally start court cases against them. And we also have to start this process of learning about our courts and recapturing our courts and finding out how we can actually stop this as a, as a society. Um, I just would like to very briefly announce that um, over the next coming um, days, um, also be even before the next Techno Crime Fight, forum I'll, I will start putting out videos again specifically aimed at how you can present um, your evidence how you can uh, make a court bundle how you can actually put everything together you need for court cases and how you can you know also um, gather evidence that um, hopefully will be will be good enough for court um, and I and, think and we really have to along going. Yes, we have to. And I think uh, excellent advice about the court cases and putting, you know, I, I think your affidavit is very close to being complete, right? Mm, yes. The template. Yeah. So that will also be very useful for people to have. And along those lines, I should probably also say, you know, along with continuing my usual podcast, I'm also hoping to put out some information talks on different aspects of the technology and the implants and look for roundtable conversations that we're going to be having soon on these subjects, on the technology, because we need to educate health professionals in particular. We need to educate doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists that Absolutely. when they hear these kinds of reports these reports are for real you know these crimes are for real the, these radiation weapons are real the COVID implantation is real and we have plenty of information to prove it and so i'm going to start putting those out both in terms of information talks and in terms of roundtable conversations with with very informed um people such as you Dr. Horton and um, various other friends that we know of, various other people, uh, colleagues and other activists who are working in the space and who are keen to bring this to an end. And so keen to also, you know, part of what we have to do inevitably is to raise public awareness, raise public consciousness and put the information out there continuously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, I, I also want people to know that we're about to um, publish um, reports um, through the Joint Investigation Group about the extent of these crimes and the nature of the crimes and how they're being committed. And based on the victim testimonies that we are already aware of and um, what we have uncovered so far, I think we can safely say that um, we can confirm that these are the, um, the worst atrocities we have seen globally since the Second World War. This is entirely on par with the Nazi death camp experiments. People are being murdered in droves. They're being brutally um, tortured and mutilated inside their homes. And it's using exactly the same pattern. So for those people who don't know the history, both in the um, during the Nazi times and in the communist system, um, what they did is the um, they corrupted entire communities. They corrupted entire neighborhoods and they really incentivized dumb gullible and corrupt people to turn on their neighbors and that's exactly the same method that's being used here so um yes and i think the one thing that we can also possibly announce although we don't have a date for it as yet is we're going to be holding an online press conference soon this will be our first online press conference and it will be the the release of our very first jit report Absolutely. And, and that first JIT report should already give um, people a very good handle on, um, you know, what to talk about. It will be, it will be a formal um, report and um, people will hopefully be able to use it. And, um, and by the way, I also encourage other professionals because, um, you know, the intelligence world is not the only, um, the only community that has seen this huge corruption and this criminality because both the medical profession, the whatever's left and is still sane of the psychiatric profession, um, they all are in deep capture. Um, and they are all affected by huge amounts of illicit money flows that seem to be funding the most criminal, outrageous um, operations 
we've we've seen you know um and and one of the things i would really like to recommend so what we did with the um the jit is that we just got together as uh, professionals with our own qualifications and um we founded an, an organization and, and a working group that um operates entirely independently from the government from any government um and we are only accountable to our own selves um, so what goes into the JIT is our integrity and our professional skills and um, the JIT report will be based on that and the evidence that we have seen and assessed ourselves. Now I've, I've also seen um, other examples of um, people getting together um, when they realize that their old organizations are in deep capture and putting out information autonomously um, and totally independent from these organizations to counter what's coming out of those organizations. And if I may just draw people's attention to, to one um, example that I personally, I mean, I'm blown away. Um, I've heard about it before, but now I actually went through in detail and looked at what they did. But there's an um, organization called, hang on, let me find, sorry, forgive me. I shared my screen and now I lost the tab where it is here. Yes. Um, so there's, an organization called uh, the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Okay, now this is um, a website, it's called consortiumnews.com. And um, if you go to this, um, I will put it into the link into the description below the, um, the video. But if you go to this um, website, um, you will find the publications um, from this group. And these are all intelligence professionals. They've put out, I think, almost 50 um, reports. And they started compiling these um, memoranda, for example, to President um, Donald Trump or to the American people, to President Obama, and so on and so on. And these are um, retired intelligence professionals or sometimes whistleblowers who um, you know, left the, um, the intelligence agencies before their retirement. And they got together and they are now independently on, you know, using their own skills, countering a lot of the statements that are coming out of the intelligence community. For example, the latest one from July 2017 is a challenge of the evidence that um, claims to support um, this, uh, this claim that uh, Russia, you know, um, hacked. Um, the, the, this is a, the, um, the DNC computers, the DNC service, the Democratic National Committee um, computers, um, and was somehow interfering, um, you know, with the elections and, and all that. And um, it's, I encourage you all to go here and actually read what these independent intelligence professionals have got to say about this, because they looked into it, they looked at the metadata, um, and they did the analysis that actually um, the um, intelligence professionals themselves did not do. And um, it's quite stunning what they have um, come up with. Um, so for example, uh, they found that the purported hack of the DNC by this, um, you know, this name called um, Gosefa 2.0 was not a hack by Russia or anyone else, rather it originated with a copy onto an external storage device, a thumb drive, for example, by an insider. The data was leaked to implicate Russia. We do not know who or what the murky Gosefa 2.0 is. You may wish to ask the FBI. So anyway, so this is a very, very strong statement. So Sorry. That's all right. Sorry, Catherine. I'm looking. I'm looking at the time, and I guess it's about that time, and we need to close the broadcast because I need to run as well. So, Absolutely. I just wanted. Uh, basically, I just wanted to finish, and I um with just one sentence, and I want sure. to, to people to sure, go, go to the um at these things, um, read the memoranda, and actually, if you're a professional in the medical services or in psychiatry, you need to start creating your own autonomous groups and opposing. Um, the criminal nonsense that comes out of your field, where basically we have to grow up and each one of us has, has to take responsibility for our own fields. You know, I have to start taking responsibility for science, Ramal is taking responsibility for um, journalism, and, and Karen is taking responsibility for also intelligence work. And other people have to imitate us. That's all I'm saying. So if you want to help us, you have to start fight the criminality on your cabbage patch basically so your audio much more clearly than me over here because clearly my computer is being hacked currently 
I'm having a lot of trouble decipher what you're saying. So, um, and your video is frozen at my end as well. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, Ramola. And you know what? What you are describing and the way your computer is being hacked is eerily um, uh, similar to how Millicent is being hacked. And I distinctly remember that this Very much. started when you started reporting about uh, Randall Webster. And it seems to be the case that your computers are now being hacked by the same methods. And we know that he's controlling, yes. you know, an entire so-called old boys network of criminal thugs. So I almost have to get exactly feeling. this is. You're being, you're being hacked. This kind of hack, this particular group. kind of hacking has Randall Webster's mark on it. And if you recall, there was a van with tenants um, parked in my street for a few days. Yeah, exactly. Um, when this first happening. Absolutely. So I wonder if this guy came and installed. Absolutely. I think exactly now people can see that um, what we're dealing with and you can go back to the old um, editions of Techno Crime Fighters Forum and look at the um, the evidence submitted by by Millicent because um, she is being oh here's Millicent. So um, hi Millicent. Hi I'm, I'm driving so I'm going to pull off shortly and just sit and listen to the end of the uh of the podcast. So basically, it's, it's exactly perfect timing that you come because what um, what has happened is that Ramola is being hacked, her computer is being hacked, and um, her audio was messed with, and she, um, her screen froze, and she couldn't take part, and we were just, I was just making the point that she is being hacked in exactly the same way as you, and I remember that the hacking of her computer started when she started reporting about Randall Webster, so I am pretty convinced that his group of criminal thugs is now also attacking uh, Ramola's computer because it's it's almost identical yeah it's it's just amazing how they are able to do all of these things but we just keep persisting in in what we're doing and that's trying to expose it and working to to live and, and to help others to keep living Absolutely. And, and I, if anything, what we have to do is um, we have to unify forces. And now um, Ramola can back you up on pretty much everything, you know, that you've said, because she's experiencing exactly the same hacking. And I think also if we, if we correlate it with time, we can say that this goes directly back to the report about um, Randall Webster and his criminal shenanigans. So I'm pretty sure he's involved. I am not surprised. Just the amount of time that it takes me to get the notification for the podcast. I noticed that it came in this morning like at 10, 11, but I didn't get it until 10, 23. And I, oh, I specifically no. look for it because I know that, that the podcast is happening. Last week, I didn't get it until after the podcast was almost over. That's ridiculous. So exactly. I mean, this is the delaying of emails is also a staple of the intelligence agencies and then all the criminal organizations that are being funded and run by them. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Yes. Um, I, I, by the way, so what Ramola has just dropped out. We have to wait for her to come back because she has to terminate the, the podcast. But in the meantime, as we're waiting for her, I just would like to share something that, um, is direct evidence of interference um, by the intelligence agencies. So um, I would like to um, share my screen um, and show people something that um, I, I tweeted um, yesterday that at some point Twitter started shadow banning me and um, that my tweet count suddenly dropped to one. And I also claimed that there was an invisible hand of GCHQ visible. And I, I challenged people to find out why they might have um, shadow banned me. So just to show you, when I was tweeting yesterday, um, the average tweet would have something like 228 um, impressions. And then, you know, 11 people might retweet it or something like that. So something like between 5 and 10% um, of engagement is kind of normal. And then suddenly I sent a tweet, um, and that was just 20 minutes later, and suddenly the impressions dropped down to one, a single impression. But curiously, the number of engagements was three. So how can there be three engagements if there was only one person who saw it? You know, I mean, first of all, for only one person to see it when before it was like 200 something is highly unusual. But then to have more engagements than impressions is physically impossible. So there was 300% 
uh, of engagement rate here. So what this actually is, is a direct proof of shadow banning. So there was some sort of um, software interference with my tweets um, and it was modified on their end and this is server side because only they can actually modify these views here. So there was some server side interference and the interference started with this tweet when I pointed out that I got a promoted ad on my Twitter stream and it was advertising green cards. And I was making a joke and I was pointing out that I always get very, um, you know, the promoted ads I get on Twitter are virtually almost a direct commentary on my life. Um, very, very timed. And, um, you know, it's by now a joke. So I just said, what, does, uh, tw what is Twitter trying to tell me that I should just bugger off to, to America? Um, and as soon as I put this tweet in and I pointed out that my... Um, Twitter stream is being, um, I'm being messaged through the promoted ads and that I'm blaming GCHQ, suddenly the engagement rate, uh, sorry, the impression rate was taken down to one and, and all these numbers went crazy. So it's it's um, absolutely impossible that those numbers are, are real. So what this shows is it's direct proof of, of hacking by GCHQ or one of their tentacles, you know. Um, yes, and, and absolutely. Just, We're constantly doing it. I, I'm back, by the way. And um, Millicent, hi, it's good to see you. Although we uh, were sort of at the end, I think, of this broadcast, unfortunately, and we have to close pretty soon. I thought it was very interesting that they bumped me off just as I was stating that the van was parked in my street with Tennessee license plates um, or just across from my neighbor's house, the one neighbor who I think is uh, very much involved with the DIA in uh, messing with my computer and watching what I do in being on top of my browser and literally, you know, doing cyber hacking from right next door. So very interesting. So, you know, if these guys very think that they are being super covert or clandestine, I, I think they're, they're failing and falling miserably at it because we know our neighbors, we know their names, we know where they live and we see what they are doing. Yes. And now the next step will be that we'll be charging, bringing criminal charges against these Nazis for this is what they are. Yeah, it's absolutely shocking what's going on. It's just shocking. But in any case, it's been a very interesting morning and um, all of the things that we talked about. Millicent, is there anything in particular that you would like to touch on before we close? No, there isn't. Actually, when I signed in, I signed, I uh, turned off the camera so that I would not be seen, ju just so that I could be able to talk to you ladies after the podcast. I've just had a, a biofeedback scan done and and it confirms that my body is being bombarded with x-ray and with ultraviolet rays oh my goodness but this is what we mean about it's, there being evidence you know for everything that reporting victims are reporting there is indeed evidence there is indeed a physical trace in the body there are bio effects Yes, and also as far as the X-ray bombardment is concerned, I mean, um, I have shown on previous um, shows my yellow um, Geiger counter, that's a professional Geiger counter, and I can confirm that every half an hour or so, there was a huge um, dose of radiation, but always pretty much the same dose. So it wasn't just a natural random distribution you would expect, but it was always either very low or exactly this one band. And I think that implies some sort of X-ray surveillance where they literally X-ray your entire home. But you also get a huge, you basically get a chest x-ray you know every single time i think the dosage is pretty much equivalent so when you get a chest x-ray every half an hour your body um will eventually show the damage mm -hmm. and the fact it that your geiger counter was stolen. stolen exactly and the fact that my geiger counter was stolen so three things one of them was the little green um measuring device that showed these radiation attacks so well the second one was the geiger counter which showed the radioactive um attacks and then the third one was the bug detector with which i could find my body chips so those three devices are now gone mm -hmm. thanks to the ndb yes yeah, since and so we're going to continue talking about all of this in, you know, succeeding episodes and in, and in other modalities um, that we're going to be putting out shortly in podcasts and roundtables and so forth. So I just ask everybody to stay tuned and I'd wish everybody a good morning. And if you ladies are ready, we can ask this morning and come back another day. So Thanks, everybody. Now. See you next week. Bye for now. Bye. See you next week. Bye.